Life Boat Live, we have four simple rules. Number one, we don't discuss politics, ever. Number two, this is not a religious channel, and while you might hear people say, God bless you, or I'm going to pray for you, or I wouldn't have gotten through this without my faith, that's fine. What's not fine is to say, my God is better than your God, or here's why you're not getting into heaven. It's not going to fly. Number three, we believe wholeheartedly if you can't control your tongue, then you can't control your life. So while on board, there's not going to be any cursing in the live chat, period. And number four, there is no room for mean people on the lifeboat. Because we discuss very sensitive things from people's past in our group setting, we got to protect those people. The only way they feel confident and comfortable discussing those things is in an environment that is free of trolls and mean people. So if you're a mean person or you're a troll, we're going to block you for life. And if your account happens to be less than 24 hours old, we're probably a little suspicious right from the word go. Why? Well, because there are people in this world who enjoy being cruel solely for the sake of being cruel. It's not going to fly here. But if you're here because you're trying to get sober and live your best life, then you might find that the lifeboat is just that, a lifeboat. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and we will see you on deck. Hey everybody, I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and you are on the lifeboat. Boy, that almost felt like YouTube, didn't it? <laughs> All right, so we, uh, can I get a five by five? From all folks involved, we got a five by five, by five by five. That would be great. Hey, look at that. There we go. Appreciate you. You know what? There is a, uh, let's see. Here. Ah, sorry about that. Little, uh, we're, we're learning here. <laughs> there we go. Look at that. Five by five. Now we're back. Now we're back. This is a little bit of growing pains. We're going to get, uh, we're going to get used to this. So, <clears throat> happy to be here. I really am. And a uh, special shout out to um, to Cedar, who did an amazing amount of work to make this so that I didn't look like a complete nutter idiot. Just partial idiot, but not a complete nutter one. There we go. Get this thing all set up. So if you read the, uh, if you read the thumbnail, this is a uh, show we're going to talk about stress. The last time I did a show on stress, oddly enough, um, Mark was here and the two of us were talking about a, uh, a day we had that was a bit of a challenge from a uh, creator standpoint. And it's probably not a coincidence that I'm doing that again this time, because once again, this has been a day that has, um, has been a challenge. I got a, uh, got an email this morning from somebody and you know what? The last time I did this, it was like four people who could have thought, you know what? This is probably me. This time, there's only one person. They're going to know this is them. And, and I'm sorry, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm not going to use anyone's name. But I got an email from someone this morning that uh, was struggling, as we all do, with the sobriety game and really having a hard time. And I can feel for people who are in that, uh, in that place because it's difficult, right? We all know it is. However, this person decided that, um, like has happened many times in the past, this person decided that they were going to um, they were going to talk about ending themselves, taking themselves off the planet. So they uh, they left me a uh, comment that said, "You know what, Cap? This is probably the last time you're going to talk to me." There are people who reach this place and say things like this a hundred out of a hundred times they have relapsed or they're using they're drunk they're high whatever and very often if i fire back an email instantly and i say hey you know what um really like to talk to you about this whatever we can get a dialogue going uh occasionally either they they feel like i didn't get to them fast enough or 
you know, maybe they passed out, whatever the case may be. But uh, I meant I end up with um, the inability to get a hold of somebody. This time it took me about 15 minutes before I saw the email. And after 15 minutes, uh, I responded back and I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything back. This was this morning. And I'm talking about after my, uh, my live feed this morning. So this was early, 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 early. And I didn't hear back from this person until about 40 minutes ago. And Mark and I talked about this uh, the last time this happened, but I, I need to talk about it again because uh, this can kill you. <laughs> if you're the host of a show like this, this is damaging stuff. It really is. Uh, I understand that we go through really traumatic stuff and it's, it's, it's a part of the whole sobriety thing. I get it. I do. And I understand that if you're working through things, that this these kind of things can happen. It's a very difficult thing to, to cope with. And I joked about this the last time, and it sounds funny, but, it, but I'm just as serious as hell. What ends up happening every time this <clears throat> takes place is that you think to yourself, oh, God, please let this person be okay. Please let this person be okay. Because going through your head, you're thinking 15 minutes, man, if I, if I had been on that a little quicker, you know what I mean? I heard the tone, but it was early in the morning and I thought, you know, it could have been this, this or this, but I heard the tone and I didn't get over there in 15 minutes. And you start beating yourself up about that. And, and then you start thinking to yourself, do I know exactly what part of the country this person is in? Can I, can I reach out? Can I do a, a health and welfare check? Right? What, what can I do? And, and you beat yourself up for a while. And then you get the, the notice that you get another email or you get a text or whatever that says, you know what, Cap, I'm really sorry. It was really a tough morning. And for a split second, you think, oh, thank God. Thank God this person is okay. Thank God this person is okay. And then the next thought is, I would like to kill them. <laughs> I would like to put my thumbs on their throat because... While that person is working through what they've got going on, I'm living in hell, right? All day. And it costs a lot of other people any kind of help that I could be giving them because I'm not worth a, a fart, pardon me, on a day like that. I'm not worth anything because all, all the time in your head, the gears are turning. What could I have done differently? You know, how did I blow this? I've had interaction with this person in the past. Did I do this wrong? Did I do that wrong? And you start beating the hell out of yourself. And you would think that after this has happened to me a dozen times or so, that you might just start saying, ah, they're probably going to be okay, but you can't do that. It's not something that, that you can do and feel comfortable about. Because I've told the story on here before, but there was a time where I got a uh, an email that says, that said, I... I would rather die than, than deal with what I have to deal with tomorrow. And then that person took their life. And if you're the host of a show like this, you will spend the rest of the time that you're on this planet wondering if you could have done something different to keep that person alive. So this is a, this is a call out, please, to everybody. Don't do this. Don't do this. If you really feel that that's where you're at, how about reaching out to me and, you know, waiting for me to respond back and let's, let's communicate, let's talk. But this is the kind of stuff that will short circuit anything that we're trying to do good here, because I don't know how many of those a host has in them, right? I really don't. I do know that the last time this happened, um, I had a partner that was here every day with me. And right before we went live, he was saying, you know what, man? I don't know if I can do this. You know, we had two that day that did the exact same thing. And one did a disappearing act for about six hours. And it worked over my partner. It really did. It worked him over. And please, right? Please. I know that when we're in there and we're feeling like the world is about to end and everything in life is pressing down on you, it's very difficult sometimes to think about other people to think about the big picture, 
It is. And I know I was that guy for a great portion of my life. I was that guy. But we're all pulling for the common good here. We really are all trying to help one another. And this does not put me in a position where I can help you. And it certainly doesn't put me in a position where I can help other people. So if I sound like a jerk, I'm not trying to. I swear to you, I'm not trying to. But this is a, uh, this is a really hard situation. And it's one that I would love to see not happen again. Um, so, and if, it, and if you were the person that I'm talking about, I'm not mad at you. I'm really not. I just am asking you that uh, to do what you can to make sure that this never happens again. Uh, because it's, it's difficult. Sorry, people, but I just got a text while I was doing this. Okay. So <clears throat> that's that. And I don't want to, uh, you know, that's, that's never fun. You can't really, you can't really make that speech and not feel like a jerk. Even if you, even if you weren't one, you just kind of feel like you are right. That's just kind of the nature of this. So and it, it's kind of appropriate. And it's and one thing has nothing to do with the other, whether you believe that or not. But I was planning on doing this on stress before this happened. And the last time we had already prepared an entire show on stress before it happened. And it just maybe I shouldn't do shows about stress. Hey, squirrel nut zipper. So stress. The uh get back on track. Because I'm, I'm telling you, people, I absolutely hate that. I really do. So we talk about the frontal lobes, right? The frontal lobe of the brain does a lot of um, higher functioning. That's a term that they like to use. It's responsible for higher function. Um, if you're setting goals, if you're uh, making a plan, if you're making decisions, you know, door one, door two, door three. If you're making decisions or doing any of that, it's going to be your frontal lobe that's pulling the trigger on that. Um, it also helps you keep focus. So that if you're trying to concentrate on a particular mission or a particular goal, it's the uh, the frontal lobe that makes that possible to really uh, sort of focus in. It also is closely attached to um, the memory. So remembering, although the memory parks in a different part of the brain, it's the frontal lobe that's going to pull that memory out and allow you to remember things. And it is, uh, it's really a situation that, uh, Oh, and it's also going to keep you cool, right? It keeps your head when you when you feel like exploding, like three minutes ago. <laughs> what keeps your head in that game is going to be the frontal lobe. And the uh, the reason that I bring this up is because when we start feeling stressed out, the part of us that is really causing that very often is the frontal lobe. And we have found through research that the frontal lobe and the hippocampus parks it here on the side, right? The hippocampus is um, it's on both sides of the, uh, of the brain and it really deals with um, memory. Both parts of the brain are damaged by stress damaged. Like this is not um, this really is something that, you know, it's not a, a theory. This is an absolute fact that when you're living under stress for long periods of time, you shrink the cells in those two parts of the, uh, of the brain. And what that does, you know, the really cool pictures that we always see that very often are lit up in different colors. Um, so you see the neuron and you see all of these things almost look like lightning that's coming off of the side of them. When the cells start to shrink down, those, those long tendrils start to, to lose the gap between the two of them. And this causes all kinds of havoc to happen in the brain. So, Stress is not just one of those things that, that we talk about or that you read about in self-help books. Stress can jack up your brain in a really, really big way. Stress can hurt you. So we need to start thinking uh, very seriously as addicts about how we can work on uh, cutting down stress in our life. It also is one of the biggest reasons that if you're going to relapse, uh, this is going to be one of the things that causes that, right? Truthfully. Stress is one of the great motivators to make you want to turn off whatever it is you're coping with. And isn't that the nature of relapse very often for a lot of us is that 
Uh, we want to make that feeling go away. And very often feeling uncomfortable in your own uh, skin um, comes right down to living day to day with massive amounts of stress. So how do we, uh, how do we cope with it? Because that really is um, the nuts and bolts of how you're going to get through this and how you're going to cut down on your odds of relapse in a very, very big way. So there are four things that um, everybody in science recommends more than anything. That's good. Rub your face on the microphone. That's good. I'm sure that sounds really cool. Uh, the cat is getting used to the, the setup. There's all new equipment for her to look at, and she's just fascinated and wants to walk on top of all of it, right? Sorry. So um, there are four things that people in science all agree is this is nuts and bolts stuff if you want to cut down on stress. And the, uh, the first of them, these are all things that we talk about all the time anyway, but the number one thing that they say will cut down on stress is exercise. And as we've talked about so many times, you do not need to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, it doesn't need to be super cardio. It doesn't need to be, you know, any of those things. But if you're not out getting exercise, your, your stress levels are going to go through the roof. And one of the reasons is, Stress is caused by a whole cocktail of, uh, of different brain chemicals and not good ones, right? Understandably, these are not the brain chemicals we want going. Uh, one of the easiest ways to, to make what you've got in there that is not working very well. Uh, <laughs> this cat is such a fun animal sometimes. The, uh, you want to replace it with, with um, chemicals that are going to be uh, a better setup for you. And... Exercise is going to do that for you. We have always said, you know, 26 to 28 minutes a day is plenty of exercise. You don't need to be doing a whole lot more than that to get the kind of effects that we want, um, you know, to, to benefit us as addicts. Walking every day is great. For this particular um, situation, they say, if you can do 45 minutes walking three times a week, which again, you're doing a lot better if you could just do the 26 every day right? But if you get out there and you start walking every single day and you start getting that exercise going, this is going to change the cocktail of chemicals that you have in your brain. And it is going to cut down dramatically on stress. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, getting out of the house, I live in a bad neighborhood, whatever the case may be. As I've said many times on the boat, I walked thousands of miles four steps, turn around, come back, four steps, turn around, go back, four steps. I would do it for hours and hours every day because it's what I had. There was no, there wasn't an opportunity for me to take 60 steps because when I took four steps, I was at the end of the, the cage that I lived in. You can walk and get a hell of a lot of exercise no matter where you are. Most of us can get outside. Go and take that walk you know, do your, uh, your 25 minutes a day, 26 minutes a day. If however, you go to the gym anyway, fantastic, right? Try to get this to where it's a, it's a schedule that you're doing on a regular basis, because the, the more we cut down on stress, the better a chance it is that you're not going to relapse plain and simple nuts and bolts stuff. The second thing, and one feeds beautifully into two. Second thing is sleep. I'm horrendous at this. I really am. I'm awful at this. Science says we need eight hours a day. That we are absolutely supposed to get eight hours a day. Virginia says, I walk in my house. That'll work, hon. I promise you it will. You know, I did it in a very, very small room. And we used to keep track of how much one hour would get you. And you did it by counting steps multiplying that by three feet, like got really into it. Most people there got really, really into it. And we made a point of trying to walk from wherever we were, right, to wherever we lived. So thank you, Heather Joy. Yeah, you know what? I'll take it. Uh, I will take that. Uh, so I was in, I was in uh, Pennsylvania, right, at uh, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. So to walk to Reno was like 2,700 and something miles. So you would figure out exactly how much you had to do in order to do that. And it took months, but everybody on that floor did it. And some guys only had to walk to New York and some guys had to walk to Maine or Florida. I had one of the longest um, walks home, so to speak, but we all did it. And I got in amazing shape walking. 
I really did in amazing shape. And I'll tell you who's killing it is Alan Ballantyne. Like so often that happens with Alan. Alan really is the king of if it's worth doing, it's really worth doing or worth overdoing. Alan is a dedicated cat. And his target now is like 150 miles a month or something like that. Like he's, he's walking. Um, and he does it at a really good clip, a really fast pace. And he's very, very into it. But walking is going to do two things, right? It's going to help you sleep. It's going to lead into that um, eight hours that we all need. Science says for the purpose of stress specifically, let's say on Monday, you got a lot going on and you know things from the boat are stressing me out or whatever the case may be. And on, and on Monday, I get six hours of sleep. Science says you need to make up those two hours over the course of the week. If you really want things to, uh, if you want the perfect case scenario to remove stress from your life, then you need to get those two hours back. It's not enough to go, well, I'm going to get eight hours tomorrow. No, you need to get maybe eight and a quarter or eight and a half so that by the end of the week, you're back to that eight hours. And all of us can, uh, can relate to a time where you only get a couple of hours, right? You, you get two hours of sleep or you get three hours of sleep. And when we wake up, we're not firing on all cylinders by any stretch, right? We, are, we quite simply are not uh, firing on all cylinders. You don't think right. You're short-tempered. I mean, everybody knows, has been there at some time in their life. You know, I didn't sleep last well, like, you know, well last night. I'm not in a particularly good mood. All of that contributes to stress and stress contributes to relapse and all bad things. So number one is exercise. Number two is sleep. Number three, I guarantee you all can know because this just is recurring in everything that we talk about. Eating. If you're not eating and getting three meals a day in, then chances are you're not giving your body what is needed. And when you don't give your body what is needed, you begin to start stressing out. Stress is a reaction of the mind to the body not being uh, treated well. Now there's other there's a ton of other things that can cause stress, you know, things in your life, people being idiots, um, you know, uh, problems with uh, with significant others or with kids. All of those things can, can contribute. But a great deal of stress is when your body is put under stress. It is absolutely going to transfer that to your mind. And those chemicals are going to start kicking the crap out of you. Uh, Michelle says, I enjoy walking. That's a beautiful thing. If you enjoy walking, you're in good shape. That is a very, very uh, beneficial, uh, you know, a lot of us don't dig walking. I happen to like it too, but a lot of people don't like walking. If you do not get an elliptical, if you don't like doing ellipticals, get one of those rowing machines, go to a gym, do something. But if you are not physically active, then you really are fighting a, a an uphill battle with trying to to remove stress from your life. And if you're not eating well, that should be one of the easiest ones for us to work on. Now, you can eat the wrong stuff. The uh, What they say is the absolute best case scenario is the Mediterranean diet. And I'll be honest with you people, I hear the term Mediterranean diet all the time, and I don't have any idea. I had to look up what that was because Mediterranean, I thought, well, you know what? Mediterranean, like Italy, pasta, right? You know, all of these things, the... Uh, it sounded fun. Pizza, pasta, you know, maybe sausage. A Mediterranean diet is very, very heavy on fruits and vegetables. Hugely heavy on it. They also talk about beneficial fats and oils, things like olive oil, and then nuts. You know, nuts are absolutely huge. If you are getting three meals a day, you're eating the way you're supposed to and you're walking or you're exercising or you're getting that exercise in every single uh, every single day or you're getting it in three times a week or whatever the case may be. Uh, eating right, sleeping, exercising, you are three quarters of the way home. Um, the last one is one that a lot of people, Emma says, soak everything in olive oil, right? You can drink that stuff. Um, the last one is another one that... Uh, that you either are into or you're not into. But if you're not into it, you need to start. You really do. And I talk about this all the time. So this is not, this isn't something that should be a, a shocker to anybody. Macadamias are good. Pistachios are good. There are very, very few nuts that I don't like, but pistachios and uh, macadamias are great. Cashews are great. Uh, but the final is meditation. And 
if you think about it, it's it's so logical that med- that meditation would help you relax. That would it would cut down on stress. Stress very often is caused uh, by our mind running wild. So if you can take an hour a day or 20 minutes a day or whatever the case may be to simply quiet the mind, to try to remove all of the uh, active crap going on in there, if you can try to shut down everything that is coming into your mind for even 20 to 30 minutes a day, it is going to dramatically change your entire process. You are going to start relaxing. And there is a lot of science to say that meditation helps you sleep better. All of the benefits uh, of meditation are, they're absolutely incredible. And they're, for those that say, you know, I don't don't believe in meditation. I'm not into meditation, whatever. Um, There can be a religious component to this. Um, There is science to back up the fact that if you spend 30 minutes a day in prayer, it technically is not meditation, right? But it has the same effect because when somebody sits down and tries to uh, to pray, you're concentrating on, uh, you know, talking to your higher power about the things that you would like to see manifest on this planet or in your life at the exclusion of all else. Does that make sense? So if you're praying for your children or you're praying for health for somebody, you know, or, or that, you know, somebody's uh, travel will be blessed, whatever the case may be. All of the other 60,000 some odd thoughts that run through our head every single day um, are going to get shoved out of the way. So whether you're concentrating on breathing or uh, <laughs> just watching YouTube count as meditation, uh, not if you're watching me, <laughs> There are uh, there are probably some uh, some channels out there that are actually meditation channels. I know there are some that <laughs> I know there are some that uh, the sounds you know I use them constantly. Uh, I really like them for sleep. There are definitely um, channels that give you pulsating sounds at certain frequencies. And working on watches a lot, you come to really believe the whole frequency thing. Because it's what keeps time is the the vibration is a frequency with all uh, mechanical watches. And I dig those shows. I really do. I also like, um, Tommy, what can you share about the monologue dialogue in your own brain? I've just found out it's a thing. I thought I was crazy until today. Mind bending uh, in a great way for me. Um, so the, uh, the monologue or dialogue, this is the inner monologue for many people is just another way to look at automatic negative thoughts, right? Because for most of us, that internal monologue is not good. When, when the internal monologue is going for many people, what you get is I'm not good enough. You know, I'm going to end up failing on this, you know, damn it. I'm going to be late again, right? All of the different thoughts that you get during the course of the day um, that really, you know, we, we talk about ants, we talk about all kinds of things, but, the, the, and I said this before on the boat, if you want to get rid of automatic negative thoughts, try thinking positive thoughts and that inner monologue can be played with, but that's exactly what that inner monologue is. And to say, you know what? I thought I was crazy. Uh, I've had this discussion with them, um, with psychologists or psychiatrists in my life where it's, it's a fine line between an inner monologue and hearing voices, right? Uh, Hearing voices is something that is completely different. It really is an auditory thing. All of us have an internal monologue. And I struggle with mine mightily. I really do. You know, screw my life. You know, that all of the negative stuff that for me, my automatic negative thoughts are not, you know, you're going to fail. You're not good enough for YouTube or you're not good enough to be a a watchmaker. That's never the kind of stuff that, that I struggle with. But I struggle with my inner monologue cursing and being super short tempered. If I'm not saying it out loud, I'm saying it inside and the absolutely can wreak havoc on you. But on the flip side of that, it can change your life. If you can get control of it, really amazing things can happen. Wow. Boy, did I let that slow down? You know, people, when I, if I don't, uh, so with this new one, man, if I, if I pause for a second to read something, holy hell, 
you guys uh, really disappeared quickly. Joanna W says, thumbs up, y'all. I cannot argue with that. I would love that. I can't hear you. The voices on my head are too loud. <laughs> well, tell them to quiet down until the boat is over. All right, please. No, no inner monologue while uh, while the captain's talking. No, but truthfully, the um, and learning to control your inner monologue. There are books about this. There's also some pretty good videos out there uh, about the internal monologue. And I, I have found that letting it run, if that makes any sense, instead of trying to fight whatever it is, it's, it's very similar for me with meditation. Instead of trying to empty my brain and not think about any thoughts. I try to just not let any thought hang out for any length of time. So if a thought enters my uh, enters my mind, it's over that fast. I want it out. Um, I'm not going to let it sit around. So uh, you know what? Before I forget, because my inner monologue has just said something to me, and I'm likely to forget this, and I don't want to. I thought about it before the show uh, started, so I'm going to jump off of this for one second. Uh, Miss Dragon. Please do me a favor, and if you've got a uh, um, a new channel that we can hit subscribe to, if you could put it up into the uh, uh, into the comments, I would love for you to do that. And I would also love for you to post it on the um, on the Safe Harbor page over on uh, on Facebook. People, the big red button uh, did Miss Dragon dirty today, and. Since we're all here and we all have the opportunity to uh, to do a little something about it, let's uh, you know let's get that up there if we could. I would be really uh, I'd be really happy if you did that. I don't have an inner monologue as much as a series of images and emotions, aka Heather Joy. Uh, I'll be honest with you, it's the same thing, Heather. It really is. The inner monologue is not always um, you know truthfully just somebody talking, right, or a voice talking. Very often it is. It, it could be images, it could be anything that doesn't stop and that you don't have control over. The inner monologue is just what's going on in your mind when you're not controlling it, so to speak. Give what I can. We have snow here in uh, in Leeds in the UK. Love the boat. Love you all for the good cause. Thank you, Christopher. And I will say again, I always find it funny when I see the pound symbol uh, because you just see dollar signs so often that when when the pound symbol goes up, it always uh, it always reminds us that we're uh, we're worldwide. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Christopher. I really do. Um, but yeah, Heather, it could you know, and I think a lot of people can uh, can relate to what you're saying. It's not always literally a voice you know going on, but uh, sometimes images, sometimes um, you know s snippets of memories. Uh, there are things that I can't seem to shake that very often become part of my inner monologue. Um, I remember getting a couple of letters that really, really were tough. Um, and they come back from time to time. I'll be right back to where I was, opening that letter, reading the first couple of lines and, and just feeling damaged by it. That's um, that's one of the realities of, uh, of the inner monologue. It could be, it doesn't necessarily just have to be a voice saying to you, you know, it can be, even be a feeling. You know, you may not hear you're not good enough, but you may have that feeling. You know, as you start to, you're getting ready to go out and do a presentation or whatever, and you're just thinking to yourself, man, I have no right doing this. I'm not good enough to do this. It may not be a voice. You may not, you may not in, feel it as a, uh, as a monologue, but it's those thoughts that cannot be controlled, if that makes sense. So, uh, and it's one of the reasons, I'm glad that you brought it up because it's one of the reasons that meditation is so huge. It really is. By, by learning to shut off all thoughts, right? To, to be able to turn off whatever's coming in, whether it's a good thought, whether it's a bad thought, um, the, the, the idea behind most meditation, and there's different kinds of meditation. There's about a billion different kinds of meditation. But the, the gold standard for meditation is sitting there in silence. And as a thought enters your brain, you try to turn it off instantly. You don't run with the thought. You don't take it to its final conclusion. You just you try to get rid of it. And the way that this is usually done is they either give you something to concentrate on so that there's almost one thought you're carrying through the entire time, like the one-handed clap. You hear that one a lot. Um, or all you're doing is concentrating on your breathing. 
your whole focus is on the inhalation and the exhalation. And you just sort of get into that groove where that is your only thing you're concentrating on. And you can feel the air get all the way into you and you can feel your, you know, the, the lungs filling up for, from your abdomen up into your chest and then into your clavicular, um, right up underneath your, uh, your collarbones, if you're breathing deep enough and you're filling those top lo uh, lobes, but that concentration keeps you from uh, other thoughts. And in doing that, it's not just that you end up clearing out the mind. What you do is you end up being able to turn off thoughts you're not comfortable with. That's what meditation does. It's far more than the 20 minutes you spend doing it. It's that control of, I'm not going to allow this, this thought to get into my head. I'm not going to allow this to take over. I'm not even going to allow it to, to develop any kind of roots. This thing comes in, it's gone. I'm turning it off. That one comes in, gone. I'm turning it off. So if you can do that, and if you can get good at that, then when the eternal monologue starts with something that makes you very uncomfortable, you take that same skill and you turn it off. Yes, hubby can do it, but I've struggled all my life. Now I know how to turn the volume down at least or hit the mute button. There you go, right? There you go. The uh, It is a, you don't have a wrench for a link. I wish I could give you one right now, but I can't. Uh, please get over and do it on the, uh, on the uh, Facebook group page. And tomorrow I will make sure that that uh, link is put up because I would like that to happen. All righty, please. Uh, it's, if you're not good at meditation or if the concept of meditation bothers you, because there are people for whom they believe meditation is like, um, it somehow doesn't jive with most religions, right? There are certain religions, when you hear meditation, you very often think of things like um, Buddhists do an awful lot of meditating, right? There are a lot of sort of um, Eastern philosophies that, meditation is a huge part of. And for that reason, often you, you find people that say, well, it doesn't jive with what I believe. You read the Bible and it talks about meditating on the Lord constantly. That's a, the, uh, it is a term that is used again and again and again. I don't think one has anything to do uh, to override the other. I think meditation can be a beautiful thing. I picture a healing blue light that I'm breathing in and that is it envelops me from head to toe. It relaxes every muscle. It's awesome. Sarah, I love that. I really love that. I think that is so cool. Thank you, Awakened by the Looking Glass. Appreciate you. Really, I do. THC Jack. Okay. I'm not exactly sure what that word is, but Avala Kesekarasa. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, Miss V. Shalom. Yeah, that really is awesome. I love I love the uh the visual of that. Um, and like I said, there are so many different ways um, to meditate. And there are people for whom your exercise and your meditation can be uh, very, very similar. I did a lot of yoga, um, got really, really into it uh, when I was incarcerated. It was a, a very big part of, uh, of my programming and a part of my life. And it was a, uh, it's a quieting of the mind. I mean, granted, you're exercising at the same time and you're you know, you're working on, uh, on stretching and all of the different things, but there is, uh, there is really something, um, there is something really beneficial to the, the concept of controlling the mind. We're not very good at it in this part of the world. We're really not. Um, it seems that we may have been one of the last societies to really kind of get a hold of it. And it's, I've never heard, uh, I've never heard anybody say that they they began the process of meditation and regretted it. I've never heard anybody say that. Usually, if you can uh, if you can do it or get into it, it's going to uh, it's going to be something that <laughs> that makes you uh, happy. It really is. It's going to be something that makes your life easier as you go. I promise you. That is one of the um, it's one of the beauties of it. I had to send this one. Meditation is my dig and so is yoga. It heals and helps me express my anger outwards in a great way. Christopher, you're not the first person I have heard say that. That yoga has become uh, something that they use to um, to deal with the, with anger and aggression. Really, there, are, there were pilot programs 
inside the uh, federal system where they worked specifically with gang members who very often have been programmed to be violent. I mean, truthfully, that's kind of what a gang is. And they had a lot of success um, by getting people really uh, into that whole thing. If you do it enough, you can meditate without trying. I've heard other people say that. Coburn, I have never been that guy. For me, it takes a uh, a tremendous amount of um, a tremendous amount of effort and a tremendous amount of concentration. That said, what has worked for me easier than anything else um, in my sobriety is not trying to shut off all thought because it just doesn't work for me. You know, that's those sixty thousand thoughts that I'm going to have during the course of the day. Do not want to turn off. <laughs> For 20 minutes or 15 minutes. I've never been able to control that. Uh, what I've gotten good at is the kind of meditation where a thought comes in and I think, um, you know, whatever the whatever the thought is, I need I, I gotta stop by the cowboys, I gotta pick up two watches. Instead of focusing on it for a long period of time, I go, gotta pick those up. Okay, I'm done. And it allows the next thing to come in. And as long as I'm not spending more than a couple of seconds on each uh, thing that comes in, it really ends up, uh, making that start working for me. I've truly enjoyed your time speaking here. You had me ugly crying and releasing so much. I love that. Did you guys hear that comment? Heather Grace, well done. You got to love it when you read stuff like that. I, uh, I enjoy what Heather does here. I think she's a, a fantastic addition to the boat. And, uh, I think we're blessed to have her, uh, you know, her presentations and her approach. It takes a lot of effort and concentration. Absolutely. And you become Zen and it pr uh, promotes breathing and better um, mindset. Uh, you know, it's really funny because when you talk about breathing, I think we're, you know, we, we tend to think that man, you, you don't need to learn how to breathe. Right. I mean, if you stop breathing, bad things happen. We all know how to breathe. We know how to breathe from the first day we come out right? First day we're born, we start breathing and we never stop. So obviously we're good at it. We're not. Uh, most people take uh, breathing for granted and it's done correctly. Breathing exercises can also change your life. We do not get enough air into our lungs. We're really bad at it. And uh, I did probably more of that than I did anything else when I was locked up because wherever they put you, right? That was one of the things that you could do. And um, I had got a book on breathing exercises and, and there's so many different ways that you can do it, but, uh, I really have, um, have benefited from changing how I breathe. Uh, and when you really get, <laughs> that makes Tommy, our captain Merrill Steuben. I have, uh, I've heard that one before. Uh, I've absolutely heard that one before and it is the love boat. Um, I think Monk just said, scary when you can't breathe. Yeah, when you can't breathe, it does get to be uh, a difficult thing. One of the, the uh, exercises that I worked on a lot while I was in, and when the more you read about the whole breathing techniques and all of that, when we get that panic, that panic feeling that we so badly need a breath, it's not because we are out of oxygen right? We're very comfortable with the feeling of being out of oxygen. What we don't like is the buildup of carbon monoxide. That feeling is what causes unbelievable panic. And learning to be able to, uh, to calm that. Um, I have controlled breathing in for seven seconds, hold for seven seconds and breathe out for seven seconds. Believe it or not, um, that is one of my favorite exercises in the world. And I started off doing it and then getting to the point where I was doing it longer and longer and longer. And with breathing exercises, I would get to a point where I can go 30 seconds in, hold it for 30 seconds and 30 seconds out. And that for me was so much easier than meditation, but it still ends up shutting off your mind to anything else because to concentrate on trying to get a rhythm for that. And like everything else, it's that same feeling of panic when the carbon monoxide starts to build up in your body, that's that feeling of, I got to get that out. With the breathing, it's really important. And when you can control it, 
Uh, it can control your uh, reactions. I, there really is something huge about that. You know, every once in a while you see a comment, you think I probably wasn't catching the rest of that conversation like my left butt cheek was. <laughs> Joanna, I don't know. I don't know how that one started, but that was great to see <laughs> to see rolling that up the screen. Oh, that's funny. I'm sorry. That really is funny. T Prada says, "Hi, I'm really late tonight. Stuff happens. It absolutely does, and we're not uh, we're not uh, mad at you. I promise." My favorite breathing exercise is breathing in a lot of cannabis smoke and then breathing it out. Uh, and from my understanding, it doesn't do any good to hold it in. You know, to to hold that. That's a whole different mindset these days. But that is, that is a breathing exercise of sorts. It definitely is. I do that a lot, Vicky, and it scares me when it's uh, when my daydreams come true. You know what? If my daydreams come true, I'm usually pretty happy. But I daydream cool stuff. Okay. Do, 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 do. See, like I said, man, if I stop just for one second, it really starts to... I'm not mad at you, uh, M. Hunt. I'm not mad at you, bud. Don't worry about that. We're good. We are absolutely good, I promise you. I'm uh, I'm a lot more laid back than most people think. I am, and again, I, I, we're not, I've never been a uh, an anti-drug channel. I'm not. I'm an anti-addiction channel. If, uh, if drugs are not a problem in your life, I don't care that you're doing them. I really don't, you know? And, and, and if they're a problem in your life, I mean, it's your business, but... I do like to uh, I do like to fight addiction because it's uh, it ruins so many people. It really does. It ruins so many people, and it's and right now it's just dangerous as hell. Uh, you know, one thing real quickly because I'll, I'll shoehorn this in, and it, and I won't make it an entire political show. But if you've been following the news at all, there was a uh, there was a family, four individuals that went across the border into Matamoros, to, uh, Mexico. And they were kidnapped. And two of the uh, individuals were, um, were murdered. And uh, the other two were found, right? Uh, and sadly, this is, you know, you, you hate to hear that. You really do. It's exactly right. I'm your captain, not your mother. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is really, a, it's a painful thing to hear. And we don't like hearing that, that Americans or anybody else for that matter um, gets, uh, you just don't want to hear that. Yep. Truth is different than the story, Tommy. I believe that too, Stacy. I really do. But the part that really affects me is this, uh, we are now unbelievably engaged as a country and talking about maybe even sending some troops in there because this kind of crap with the cartel cannot stand, right? Because they attacked two people on their side of the border, killed two people. I find it unbelievable that there are so many people that are going to die in our country today and nobody got pissed off enough about it to talk about going in there and taking care of the cartels. But if we lose two people on their side of the border, it just goes to show you what I say every time we talk about this. We, in their eyes, were losers. In their eyes, were write-offs. And sadly, it's not just drug addicts. You know, it's somebody that just decided to do a couple of pills or somebody that they were in pain. There's that terrible story of the girl that had her uh, her wisdom teeth out and said, you got to bring me back home. I got to get some pain meds. And somebody in the car said, I got a perk. And she said, that's what my prescription's for. She took a perk, set 30 and was dead before they could get her to the hospital. These kind of stories are painful, but that doesn't matter to our government. It doesn't matter whether it's 300, 400 or 500 people that we lose today. That's not going to get them angry. I'm not angry enough to do something. But if we lose two who are not drug addicts, man, call in the National Guard, right? Call in the National Guard. A toddler ate fence someone left out. Um, oh, man. At an Airbnb. I, You know, I read that story, Emmont. I read that story. Uh, a, a toddler did die yesterday at Fent. And you know what? That's enough to make me want to send in the National Guard or the Marines to take care of these scumbags that are pumping this crap into our country. Um, I wish that the stuff that was taking place on this side of the border was um, making politicians as angry as the stuff that was happening on that side of the border. 
Together we stand. I, I agree with you, Monk. I really do. And you know something? There are some uh, there are some opportunities that are going to be coming up in the near future that are going to uh, to probably give us a chance to get this message out a little bit further. You know, I uh, <clears throat> there's some good stuff coming on. Or public serpents. I really like that term. I really like that term. Oh, man, you lost a book in an airport. That really would bum me out. The cartel is not to play with. You're right, Sarah. They are not. And sadly, uh, we're allowing them to, uh, to do some pretty ridiculous things. One of the other things that I've been deep diving on is, you know, when cannabis was illegal in this country, you know, pretty much across the board, they had huge cannabis grows that were organized. They were cartel grows and they were on the, uh, obviously on the Mexican side of the border and incredibly organized. They had um, irrigation systems set up near rivers so that they had watering systems and drip systems. I mean, really, they knew what they were doing. And um, most of the plants had been started inside and were, uh, were cloned females. And they just did a very good job of what they were doing. And recently, they're finding these grows on the U.S. side of the border. But the DEA is saying it is absolutely the footprint is identical or the thumbprint, whatever you want to look at, the uh, is identical to what the cartels were doing on their side of the border. And what that means is we've got the cartel now operating, operating big time in the U.S. of A. And I assure you, it's not just with growing dope. It's getting stuff across the border and pressing it here. Um, I've just been reading about this so much lately. This has been an area of research because I'm getting ready to do a, uh, a pretty big show that might be done in four segments. But it's all about this. Um, and sadly, uh, you know, most of these, you know, we're now into second and third generation cartel stuff. You know, that may, that may be one of those things that we don't seem to... Uh, to think about. That's exactly right, Guacaholic. Um, this is something we may not think about, but the, you know, now we have lawyers, you know, the cartel members sent their kids to the U.S. and they got trained to be, a, you know, lawyers and doctors and all of these different things. We're, we're getting to the point where um, this is a very, very uh, frightening situation that we're in. The amount of stuff that they're buying, uh, in terms of weaponry and, uh, you know, this is going to be an army if we don't do something about it uh, quickly. Sorry, I have to leave prematurely. I have to sleep for work. Keep spreading the good word. I'm pro USA. Always have been. Um, watch Chase the Heat too. <laughs> Excellent. Never miss it. Um, yeah, Sarah, I'm very sorry. Um, I know that Sarah lost a... Uh, her husband to the cartel violence. This is why we're supposed to have militias. I'm not going to argue with you on that, my friend. I'm not going to argue with you on that. And uh, it is even sp spoken about, you know. ZW, glad that you're here. Glad that you're listening. Hey, Franklin is here as well. Good to see you, Franklin. Really good to see you. From what I know, they're also worshiping Saint Muerte uh, or Saint Death in English, I think. Uh, there are definitely death cults that are a big part of that, you know, that entire setup. Uh, and that there was a, uh, there was a very famous case of a, uh, of them capturing a, uh, a DEA agent, um, and torturing and killing him on the other side of the border. And there was a lot of that crap that was involved in that. Some of that, uh, um, you know, those death cults was a, a huge part of that. Kiki, Kiki, you know who's going to tell me? Stacy Michaels is going to tell me. Stacy, what was the name of that agent? I feel awful not remembering it. Kiki, damn it. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Thank you, ZW. Really appreciate you. I really do. Thank you so much. Kiki Camarillo. You see, I knew she was going to get it, and I knew she would be the first to get it. Um, Stacy, well done. Awful story. Absolutely an awful story. Um, 
just a, and a great guy and a, you know had a family. It was just a, a really really awful story. But you know something, um, that was one of those golden opportunities where right then and right there the U.S. should have gone in there and kicked the ever loving hell out of a lot of people down there. And we you know what stopped that from happening? Dirty crap from one country to another. For real. People, there is so much that goes on in our country that is just, you know, what we do in concerns with the, with the cartels and things south of the border has an amazing amount to do with who happens to be in office in their country. If, you know, if, if a new administration gets uh, voted in down there, everything changes. And we've got to get to a point now where uh, we do something about it. They leave offerings and pray for spirits to go into the drugs. So I'm thinking uh, I was taking evil in with my uh, crystal. You were. <laughs> Make no mistake, you were. Yes, that's right, Stacey Michaels. That's the, uh, the three-letter agency that I know if I say here, I'm in deep trouble. Have you watched any of the new Vice docs? Um, I love Vice. I do. Um, and all of their documentaries. I think that... Uh, Vice does amazing work. They do amazing work. And yeah, I watch it religiously, actually. Really, really religiously. Yeah. You know what, Heather? I, I love that. I really do. Heather Joy is a... Uh, we're lucky Heather's here. Very glad that, uh, that you're on the boat, Heather. I really am. Like, really, really am. So, people... I don't know if you noticed, but there was an intro. Huh? The, pulling all that off here on the boat. Now, the question will be, uh, will that happen with Cedar gone? I don't know. You know what I mean? The, uh, Cedar certainly had a, uh, a very big hand in that. But uh, psychosis and demonic activity have the same symptoms. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, the, uh, the amphetamines... You know, amphetamine psychosis is a real thing. It really is. It's uh, and it's a terrifying thing. It's one of those. Uh, it's one of those things that um, you know doesn't get enough uh, doesn't get enough notice. It is eight already, depending on what time zone you're in. It's not. It's uh, here at six already. Uh, but people, so we got a little new equipment, uh, and we've got. I don't know. I'm pretty happy with uh, with how all of this goes. I really am. I think that uh, this has been this has been a real benefit. Look at that. See, I almost know what I'm doing. Like this is, I really kind of feel like I know what I'm doing. I know it's kind of crazy, but um, it is really starting to uh, to come together here. Huh? <laughs> so let me see something here. Get off. I hate pop-ups more than anything in the world. I really do. I hate them. There we go. Look at that. All righty, peeps. So I am Captain Tommy Scoble, and I'm going to be back tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. And I have a feeling I'm going to have uh, this stuff mastered by then. Eh? Believe that? Yeah, I don't know if I do either. But uh, all right, I'm going to go eat some orange chicken. Yeah, like uh, Captain Chow's or, you know, orange chicken, like stuff you get at Chinese restaurants. And it's good. I really enjoyed that stuff. All right, people. Between now and tomorrow, take care of yourselves. For real. The people you're going to reach out and save ought to be you. And this is a cat in a basket. She really fits a lot better in this basket, too. Did you notice? It's a way better setup. She's a much happier kitty in this basket. All right, everybody. You guys have a great night. Uh, I love you. Mm -hmm.